Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. We are very happy. We're very happy to have our second pronunciation day with a very uh, dear person to all of us. And um, But I'm not going to say anything because Bruno this time is going to introduce our speaker. Bruno, over to you. Yes, we were super excited with day two of pronunciation week. It's a great pleasure, uh, not only because this is an amazing uh, uh, event and a project, but also because we have the privilege to listen to some of our dearest friends and aspirations in the EOT industry, uh, Igor Cavalcanti. Uh, Igor is a teacher and teacher trainer based in Sao Paulo. He has been in EOT for going on 20 years and has vast experience in preparation for exams such as the IELTS, TOEFL, FCE, and especially CAE and CPE for teachers. He holds, among others, the CPE, the CELTA, the Delta Modules 1 and 2, and he's currently working on his Delta Module 3, which we can definitely get it, right? Um, and his main interests in ELT involve extensive reading, phonology, and LDT. He travels extensively to speak at teaching conferences on these and other topics. Igor is the first vice president of Brass TESO, and he will be the president as of 2019. And he's the author of English para Professor, published in 2015 by Giselle. And his new book, English para Professor 2, will be published in 2018 also by Giselle Editora. He's currently doing the training, trainering, training preparation to become a CELTA tutor as of February 2018. And so over to you, Igor. Thank you for being here with us. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Thanks, Thiago. Thanks, everybody. It's it's funny to do a uh, Google Hangout like that when I can't, can't actually see the people who are here. I mean, I don't know how many of you are here, but thank you all for being here. Uh, I absolutely love the title of my book, In Your Carioca Portuguese. I mean, it sounds much more interesting when you call it English para professor dois. It's much more fun than when you say it in Portuguese. In, in, you can hire us. Oh, yes, actually. Yeah. Much, much faster, yeah, really. Thanks, Bruno. Thank you very much. All right. Um, can everybody see this? Is this working for everyone? Can you guys see it? Can you see the slide? Just a second, Igor. We're, we're checking. Um, people on YouTube, can you see Igor? Is everything you see okay for you? Yes. There is a little bit of a delay, but uh, yeah. we can see we cannot see those, the slides yet. Wonderful. It's working fine, Igor. Is it? Okay. All right. Well, so again, thank you. It is an honor to participate in a Braille's event. I mean, yes, um, I've always made abundantly clear I'm a big fan of Braille's, and um, I think that this pronunciation week thing is just uh, incredible. And what an honor it is to be in the same event as Claire and Katarina and Gemma. And, you know, I'm going to confess something here. I feel a bit, uh, I'm a bit scared, actually, to be part of the same lineup as uh, Adrian Underhill and Mark Hancock. I remember that when I started teaching uh, English, I mean, some 20 years ago, first time I, I, I heard of pronunciation was because somebody gave me a copy of Sound Foundation. So to be speaking in a pronunciation event that's going to have Adrian Underhill as one of the speakers. I mean, I don't know if it sounds like a dream. It does sound like a dream, but it sounds like uh, one of the scariest things I've ever done, too. So, Adrian, I know you're not there, but if you ever hear of me and of this presentation, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you too much. You All deserve. Right. You deserve to be here. <laughs> okay. So, well. So starting then, um, one of the reasons, perhaps the most important reason, I think, we should teach pronunciation uh, diligently and uh, consistently to our students is not really to improve their speaking, as is usually believed, but actually to improve their listening skills. I think that one of the reasons why, or perhaps the most important reason why students struggle with listening so much is because they don't understand, among other things, connected speech. 
So one thing is to understand is to know the words this and year, but a very different thing is to be able to understand this year when you're listening to a passage, when you're talking to somebody. So um, my curiosity about this started last year as I did Delta module two. And Luisa Tavio, when I was writing, I was writing my first um, uh, assignment for the Delta, and then I was doing it on pronunciation for listening. And Luis Otavio suggested this book to me called Phonology for Listening by Richard Caldwell, which is perhaps one of the most, I think after The English Verb, which is a book that really changed me as a teacher, uh, I think uh, it, it was the perhaps the second most important book I've ever read about uh, teaching. I mean, the one that changed me most uh, uh, profoundly. What an absolutely phenomenal book it is. And um, I learned immensely from it. And, and, and in the past year, then, I've been trying to implement in my classes, as much as humanly possible, uh, a phonology element towards developing students' listening skills. And this is what I'd like to talk to you about today. Perhaps this will sound familiar to you. Realizing that she could not understand very much of what was happening in her listening class, Myung Hee raised her hand and sat to her teacher in halting English. Teacher, the tape is too fast and I can't catch the words. So I think that uh, we've all heard in our classes, I mean, variations of this, you know, I mean, students say that they simply couldn't uh, understand what was going on in the listening passage. And when we perhaps wrote on the board the sentence that they were struggling with, they just couldn't believe it. They just say something like, it's impossible that this is what they said, because it doesn't sound anything like uh, uh, the written form, does it? Think, for example, third conditional, very big construction where you write, if I had gone to the party, I would have seen her. And then students are listening to something, or talking to someone, and they hear, they're supposed to, if I'd gone to the party, I would have seen her. And it doesn't sound anything like what it looks like. And that can be very, very difficult for students to, to, to understand. This is a real example, by the way, this sentence here. She works in an office. So on the face of it, it's a very simple sentence with just three content words and two grammatical words, preposition and the indefinite article. And it doesn't look daunting at all, does it? I mean, the student looks at a sentence such as this, and he expects to hear something like this. She works in an office. And if this is indeed what they hear, or a student- Sorry, is, Igor, to interrupt you, but we lost your slide. So could you start uh, sharing it again? Okay. What was it? Did it happen now or? Yeah, with me here just now and, and apparently on YouTube before no longer. All right, let's see. Okay. See it again? Mm hmm Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So let me, know, let me know if there's a problem again, okay? Sure. So then, uh, if students hear this, she works in an office, or perhaps a more a, a student version of that, she works is in an office. Uh, and I don't mean this jokingly. I mean, I'm not. I'm not here, obviously, to 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 mock the way students speak. It's just natural that students, especially at the beginning of their uh, careers careers as English students, that they're going to say uh, she works is in an office and adding syllables where. The syllables don't exist like that. So students can cope with these variations okay, right? So if, they, if they're exposed to this, they're happy, aren't they? It's fine. It's okay. It's something they can understand. The problem is that, as we know, this is not really how this sentence is going to be said, uttered in real life, is it? It's going to sound much more like this. She works in an office. So that uh, the... the the where one word ends and the other begins is, is, is just a blur, isn't it? I mean, it's very hard to say where one word ends and the next begins. She works in an office, she works in an office. And then we have this very simple sentence that can become an absolute nightmare for learners. It's very difficult for learners to understand a simple sentence such as this one. Uh, so my point, my contention here is 
for as long as we expect students to simply pick this up from exposure and we don't draw their attention to, to the bits that make listening difficult in a more overt way, we're not going to be helping them very much become more effective listeners. There's a great quote by Caldwell that I'm going to share with you later today, in, in which he says basically that. I mean, it's uh, um, basically we just believe, or I don't even know if we believe it, but we pretend to believe that just by exposing students to lots and lots of listening material, magically, they're going to, to be able to, to pick it up. This is my first quote of the day. We're going to have many. So uh, Arub, he said this about uh, phonology for listening. He said that most students who are accustomed to English, which is modified to take into account the fact that their learners experience difficulties understanding native speakers. I mean, if you've known me over a week, you know, I absolutely hate this term native speakers. I think this is, it's ridiculous in 2018 that we're still discussing teachers uh, uh, in terms of where they're from, I mean, as if that were relevant in any way. But if you change native speakers to proficient speakers, then I couldn't agree with him more. That when the, when the only English that students are exposed to is English that is heavily contrived, I mean, completely modified, uh, uh, to make it easier for them to understand. When this is all the exposure that they have, it becomes very difficult for students to understand proficient speakers. I'm gonna try something bold here now. I'm going to try to play something to you. Let's see if this is going to work. Uh, if you can hear me well, and if you can hear what I'm gonna play for you, what I'd like you to do is to try and write down this sentence that I'm going to play. Uh, for you, okay? It's slightly long. It's a woman talking about a boss she used to have. And I'm going to play it a couple of times. Then, Thiago or, or Bruno, if you can tell me if this was clear enough, if people can actually hear that, then I'll play two or three more times. Uh, otherwise, right. I'll just give it up and, and say it to you and show you the sentence. Okay? okay. Let's try this then. Okay, let's go. My boss at that time was a bit of a rebel. She had quite a funky hairdo and tended to wear ethnic stuff she'd picked up on her travels. I'll play it once more. My boss at that time was a bit of a rebel. She had quite a funky hairdo and tended to wear ethnic stuff she'd picked up on her travels. So apart from the fact that it's quite a long sentence, is, can, you, can you guys hear it okay? Yes, yes, I can hear it fine. All right, so again, it's a woman talking about a boss she used to have, an old boss of hers. I'm going to play this sentence two, three, four more times. Yeah? And I'd like you to try and write it down. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to play two, three, four times, one after the other. Okay, so listen to this. Oops. <laughs> Pretend you can see that. My boss at that time was a bit of a rebel. She had quite a funky hairdo and tended to wear ethnic stuff she'd picked up on her travels. My boss at that time was a bit of a rebel. She had quite a funky hairdo and tended to wear ethnic stuff she'd picked up on her travels. My boss at that time was a bit of a rebel. She had quite a funky hairdo and tended to wear ethnic stuff she'd picked up on her travels. I'll give you 15 seconds now to think about it a little while, then I'll play it once again, and then I'll show you the sentence. Write it down, think about it. Okay, one more time, last time. My boss at that time was a bit of a rebel. She had quite a funky hairdo and tended to wear ethnic stuff she picked up on her travels. Okay, now I understand that this is not exactly a very interesting listening exercise. I mean, we didn't have much in the way of contextualization. I told you what the woman's talking about, but that was it. It didn't have any questions to answer. It was not guided in any way. I mean, okay, I understand all that. Uh, this is not really a listening lesson. I, I just want to, to make a point here. Perhaps it was very easy for you to write this sentence down. But I imagine that for some of you, if not for most of you, perhaps even all of you, it was very hard to write down a few parts of that sentence. Now I'm going to show you the sentence written down. This is what the woman was saying. My boss at that time was a bit of a rebel. She had quite a funky hairdo and tended to wear ethnic stuff she picked up on her travels. Now. This is a sentence from uh, a course book of preparation for CPE. 
And this particular sentence was very difficult for my students for, for, who are uh, English teachers themselves. And it seems to me that part of the problem may have been lexical, of course, perhaps funky hairdo is not the most common uh, uh, collocation out there. It's not something that we go around saying, I mean, all the time. But apart from that, I don't think it was very challenging in terms of vocabulary. So I think that the reason why it was so hard for students to understand it, for, my, for the teachers to understand it, was perhaps the same reason why it was so hard for my student el elementary level to understand she works in an office. The problem is the, is the connections. The problem is not being able to understand some of the connections that happen there. And we're talking about proficient speakers of English, I mean, people with vast experience with English themselves. Uh, so imagine how it is for students. Yeah. So in turn, we're going to look at all these bits in red to see what might be a problem uh, in this particular bit uh, for students uh, listening. Okay. But before, I oh know, sorry, the first bit then. At and that. So I'm going to play it. I'm going to play just that part for you, for you to hear how uh, how it is pronounced. My boss at that time. My boss at that time. So you see that. <laughs> what students would expect to hear as at and that, yeah, with a full, a full vowel, a plus the, the consonant t becomes, becomes a schwa. So the vowel is reduced to a schwa and the t is elided completely. It disappears. And the same happens to that. So we have four sounds here becoming just two. And it's none of the, of the original sounds, because instead of a, eh, it's going to be a schwa, and the t is just going to disappear both times. So I think it's pretty fair to, 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 to imagine to, that this can be a problem for students. Now, think about it, honestly. It's a good thing that, at this particular point, that this is not interactive, because you can't actually answer the question. I just want you to think about it. When was the last time that you wrote something like that on the board? and actually drew students' attention to it. Look, this might be very difficult to understand because look at how things change uh, uh, in, in, in fast connected speech or, or natural, naturally connected speech. Uh, look what happens to at, look what happens to that. How are they pronounced um, in, a, in a more authentic, natural My sentence? My boss at that time. Yeah, so we have the vowel reduction and you have the elision. Yeah? And this is obviously not all of it. But before we continue, a little bit of Caldwell then. So here's what Caldwell says, I mentioned before. Students are expected to learn how to cope with this, with connected speech through osmosis. He actually uses that word, I love it. That is by listening to a lot of material. This is not teaching. This is a surrender in the face of difficulty. Our challenge is to devise teaching and learning activities that work faster than osmosis. It is, isn't it? I mean, it's so obvious that, um, in the same way that we don't just expect students to notice uh, how what we do, right? I mean, a guided discovery lesson in which we lead students to find out the rules of grammar and everything. Uh, but we don't just expose students to, to, to a lot of language and expect them to, to, to magically become able to use the present perfect and, and, and the third conditional and, and uh, participle clauses, even simple present, but for some reason, we do that to, to pronunciation. We just expect students to, to magically become able to understand that this year is the same thing as this year, that at that is the same thing as at that. And um, I think, as Cobble says, that this is really a surrender in the face of difficulty. Yeah? We're sort of just hoping against hope that vast exposure is going to do the trick. And while, it, uh, while um, Exposure is vital, it's fundamental. Uh, a little bit of guiding might actually help, right? Towards the end of the session, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas on, on how to, to, to guide students to, to, to notice these things. But to be honest, I mean, as I said in the beginning, this is very new for me as well. I've always felt that I was somehow failing my students in terms of phonology for listening. But Caldwell's book just happened in my life. Uh, halfway through 2017. So this is something that I've started putting into practice in my own lessons uh, recently. 
But I can tell you that the results are, are very easy to see. Okay, next part then of that difficult sentence. A bit of a. Now for us teachers, I mean, you know exactly how she's going to say that. But again, is that obvious for students that uh, a bit of a can sound like this? Was a bit of a rebel. Was a bit of a rebel. I don't think it's obvious at all. Yeah? I don't think it's obvious at all that a bit of a becomes a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a, yeah? or can become a bit of a. Because again, as I said in the beginning, I think it's absolutely okay if students never say a bit of a if this is not how they speak. Because if they say a bit of a, or a bit of a, uh, or a bit of a, I mean, it's understandable. But if they cannot understand a bit of a, then it's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it was a bit of a rebel. So we have here, again, a vowel reduction, the a becoming a. Uh, and you have the flap, right? Which is very common. A uh, bit of a, bit of a, da, da, da. Yeah. So again, drawing students' attention to things like that is very important, I think. Another quote, I told you there would be, oh, sorry. And there's also the linking between the vowels and the consonants, of course. So, bit of a. There's no pause, basically. And there's no pause. You, again, as I said in the beginning, you cannot see where one word ends and the other begins, because this is how the flow of speech happens, right? As Caldo uh, calls it. So this is how language happens um, in context, in, in real life. Another, another, um, Quote then. So Gillian Brown was talking about this. She was writing about this in 1977. That was 41 years ago now, wasn't it? Uh, and I think it's fascinating that this was something that was being written about 41 years ago, and still somehow it hasn't found its way into our classrooms, has it? Because um, as Bruno said at the beginning, I'm now working as a self tutor because before being a self tutor. Uh, I've worked as a, as a teacher trainer and I've observed lessons for, I mean, over a decade. And while well, I've been teaching for 20 years, so I can say, I can swear to you that I have observed every single class that I've taught. <laughs> and uh, uh, I know that there's been precious little in the way of actually um, giving students some phonology instruction for listening. But Gillian Brown in 77 was already saying that for many years, it was suggested that students would learn to understand the spoken form of the language simply by being exposed to it. This does not seem so much an example of teaching, but of testing. Students are not receiving any help in learning how to process, process this unfamiliar language. They're simply being given the opportunity of finding out, finding out how to cope. I don't know if she meant to be funny here, but I just find this hilarious. I mean, to give students opportunities to find out how to cope. I, I, I had a friend, I used to work with this hilarious teacher a long time ago who used to say, I'm sorry, this is only going to make sense for people who speak Portuguese, but he used to say that uh, he taught his students sometimes using the severe method. Have you ever heard of the severe method? It's like it just gives students something to do and you say, agora vai lá, severe, severe, it's the severe method. So, <laughs> I, have the, I have the impression that this is what Gene Brown is alluding to here, that we sometimes just give students a lot of listening via the severe method and say, go there, cope with it, severe. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it might even work in the long run, you know, because if, if I think about myself as a learner, as I was learning English, when I was learning English, I mean, in the classroom, I'm sorry, my neighbor's dogs bark a lot, as you can probably hear. Sorry about that, I can't go there and shut the dogs up. But as I was studying uh, English, I, I don't remember ever having a single class on how phonology was relevant uh, uh, for listening. I was never taught to, to notice these uh, uh, features of connected speech. And yet somehow I learned. So I'm, I'm not saying that the severe method doesn't work. It does, it might. But uh, again, as, as, as Caldwell says, our job is to find ways uh, to expedite the process, right? To start the process, to do something that's faster than just osmosis. Another difficult part then from that uh, first sentence. Now, I'd like you to think about this one for a second. I don't know if you remember exactly how the woman said this sentence, but um, how would you say? Think about it for 10 seconds. 
I'm doing it again here for you. What do you expect to hear? Okay, so now I'm gonna play it uh, once again. And you tell me if this, well, how, how can you tell me? But uh, you tell me telepathically if this is what you had imagined. Quite a funky hairdo. Quite a funky hairdo. Quite a funky hairdo. Again, not, I, I can't really hear you, but I would bet that at least some of you, and actually I would bet that most of you did not imagine that, even though you had heard this before, but you did not expect quite a funky hairdo. Quite a funky hairdo. This is called uh, some of quite you, a funky hairdo. Uh, some of you may may have heard of this. This is called uh, a glottal stop. Yeah? So instead of pronouncing the the phoneme t as t or as a flat, quite a funky hairdo, you actually have this pause, this stop at the glottis, yeah? and you say quite a funky hairdo. As uh, sometimes some speakers say. Um, water or or battle or mountain and for mountain so this glottal stop i mean if you're a proficient speaker of english and you've been listening to english and 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 watching stuff in english without subtitles and english has been uh, your life for decades or for many 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 years even if you don't use a glottal stop in your speech you, you can understand it in context right but is it obvious for our students, is it obvious to them that there is this possibility that water is going to be pronounced water and that quite a uh, is going to be pronounced quite a? Uh? Again, I've, been, I've had students for a couple of decades and I would say that the vast majority of them would not simply get this uh, because it's not obvious at all. You know? So the quite a uh, or quite a uh, becomes quite a. Uh. So what is my point here? Because there is a point. The point is we need to make students aware of these things. We need to make sure that learners are familiar with features of connected speech, that they understand that I saw it. Have you seen, uh, did you see that movie? Like, yes, I saw it. That I saw it can actually sound in connected speech. I saw it. Have you ever heard this? I saw it. You know, I think that even for me, I mean, if I hadn't heard this before, it would sound very strange. I mean, the first time, if, if, I, were, if I were to hear that particular sentence today for the first time, even being aware of the existence of intrusive ra, I'm going to go back to this in a, in a few minutes, but even being aware that this is a possibility, I saw it just sounds mad to me. So if it sounds mad to me, if it sounds mad to us, how is it that we just expect students to be able to understand it uh, without any instruction? Yeah? Law and order. The idea is, the idea, oh, by the way, first time I heard this, I had a brilliant Delta tutor. Uh, I've had actually quite a few brilliant Delta tutors, but I had one who was British. And at the beginning of a session, this was the first thing that he said, okay, guys, the idea is that they, Remember that I couldn't try head around the fact that he had just said DRA and I had no idea why. And the problem is he said that five times, making it very hard for me to actually pay attention to what he <laughs> Because although I understood what he meant, it was a shocker. It was a shocker because either I had never heard it before, which I think it's difficult, but I certainly had never had my attention drawn to it. And the first time I actually noticed it, it sounded very strange. And then I started thinking, I was thinking about, I don't even remember what he was talking about, but I, I was thinking to myself, why, but why did he say the idea is? I mean, is that really possible? Is it, a, is it just him or, or is it really something that happens uh, in, in, in more speakers' speech? And um, so if, if that was that confusing and that shocking to me, in my first input session in the Delta, imagine how we can be for a student at the very beginning of their, of their studies or an intermediate student. But again, I digress. But the, the point is we need to draw students' attention to this. How about one more quote? Sheila Thorne has a thorny one. <laughs> that was horrible. That was 2011. She said, the traditional listening comprehension approach simply tests our students' listening ability. 
it doesn't automatically train them to listen more effectively. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. I think all the focus on listening for gist and listening for specific information, that is uh, extremely helpful and important. But how about at the end of the class, after you've done the listening for gist and the listening for specific information, to actually add a few sentences from the passage? those sentences to students and say, okay, how do you say this? Right, now listen to this. Is it the same? No, what was different? Why was it different? You do it once and it's not going to make absolutely any difference. You do it twice, it's going to make very little difference. You do this always. You do this very, very, very often. And as I have found out with this one student who struggled with, she works in an office, it works. Igor, are you there? Okay, so we might be having some technical issues, but uh, Igor is going to be back in a second. So we just ask you to be patient. Yeah, I think that he had a problem with his connection. Yeah, he just. Yes, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. He just, uh, it, it was lagging a little bit, but uh, yeah. I'm well, sure he'll be back in a second. Keep on, keep on because Igor will come back and he's going to continue talking to you and um, just, just hang it in, okay? So um, while we wait, Chago, let's, um, Let's have a talk about what people have been talking in the, 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 in the chat. Yes, I think yeah. Igor is back. He didn't give us some time for us to read the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Was it the dog, Igor? I couldn't hear any dogs barking. Did you hear any dogs barking, Togo? I, I did, but I have two dogs, so I know what that feels like. Okay. Sometimes they just don't want to cooperate. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, sorry to interrupt too, I think he is, is definitely having some connection issues because I saw his picture first for a second yeah. and now I don't see anything anymore. So yeah. while... The comments and then uh, while we wait, uh, uh, we can have a chat. Yeah, someone was saying the sound was terrible. Well, the sound was okay here to me, so that might be something with your internet connection. So you might want to check that out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fernanda Peixoto says, I would like to know the name of the book. Um, Fernanda, if you mean the book that uh, uh, some of the quotes, Igor will, will share uh, them at the end of the presentation. Um, some was fine for Jay. Yes, Jay, it was fine for me here too. So uh, you folks might want to check your internet connection, maybe. Yeah, uh, restart your modem. Did you did you do the the activity that he uh, proposed? Like right? I did. I did. I did well. I, I don't want to brag, but it was about <laughs> hair and, and and different hairdos. So I'm kind of used to <laughs> crazy Lexus and, and and talking about hair in crazy contexts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It yeah. took me some time, but I think I got the, the sentence right. And Claudia did too. Claudia right wrote it like. Yeah, she did. Yeah. She did. She did perfectly, but I, I was more like repeating it in my head. So can I, 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 I could, yes, yeah. Igor, we can. I am so sorry. I don't know what happened. I really don't know what That's happened. Okay. It was that a happens. dog. We were saying that it was, it was a dog fault. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I'm back. No uh, worries. No worries. We, kept, we kept the audience uh, entertained while we were away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't know, GT. Does anybody remember what 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 the last thing you saw was? It was. It was. It was. It was. It was what? Sorry. It was a slide with a coat. There was a coat in it. I think. Yeah, and people are very curious about those references. So, okay, you folks, just hang on because at the end, Igor is going to share it all with you. I'm not. <laughs> okay, can you can you see my screen? 
Not yet. No. We can just see. Yeah, now we can see your screen. You know, so you may want to put that in presentation mode. Oh, no, 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 I was just finding the right slide. Yeah, it was it was four. It was this one. Yeah. All right. Can I see it again? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Igor. Over to okay. you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm back then. So what I was saying about Sheila Thorne is that, again, uh, she says the same thing. It does not automatically train to listen more effectively. So just giving them loads to listen to does not really guarantee that uh, students are going to become more effective listeners. All right. Uh, and I, I don't know if you heard this, but I was also, uh, I gave an example of how you can um, get this to work. I mean, how you can work on phonology for listening. So you do the traditional uh, listen for specific information and then listen for gist. But then at the end of, of the traditional listening class, you can actually, I don't know, board a few sentences from the passage that you think may have been an issue and then play just those sentences for students to compare how they would say them to how they actually uh, uh, hear them, to, to, to how, how the sentences were actually said in the passage. And then if you do, what I was saying is, I don't know if you heard this, but if you do this once, it won't make any difference. If you do this twice, it will make very little difference. But if you make this, if you do this always, if you do this consistently, then it really starts paying off. It really starts making a difference. And students start uh, understanding what it is that happens in the stream of speech, what it is that happens when uh, language, when they listen to English in authentic contexts, you know, authentic um, use of the language, yeah? not native, but authentic, proficient. So what are the elements of connected speech that we need students to be aware of. I'm going to I'm going to talk about four of them here. Although there are more. There's for example vowel reduction that we've already mentioned. Intonation can be a, a feature of, of connected speech and word and sentence stress. You know? But what I want to talk to you here about today is very quickly, very briefly, assimilation, elision, linking and intrusion. Starting from assimilation. Assimilation is, for instance, when it's the case of this year that I mentioned to you. So when uh, the last sound in a word and the first sound in the next word, they change somehow to, to accommodate each other better, to, to facilitate the transition from the first to the second. So you have that in this year, you have that when you say um, teller, so, uh, no, sorry, that is an elision, actually, a sound disappears. But you have that when you say, for example, uh, brown bag, where the n in brown changes to m because of the next sound, which is b. So instead of saying, think about it, you don't say really brown bag unless you pause. What happens is the n becomes m by labial, so that you can say uh, brown bag more comfortably. Yeah. Uh, more easily. Now, brown bag is very simple. Yeah? Brown bag is not exactly something that students are going to have difficulty to understand because of the way sounds change. But this year can be much more complicated. Uh, what is it that you buy in a cheese shop? Think about it. What do you buy in a cheese shop? Cheese, right? But you have the sound z at the end of cheese and the sound sh at the beginning of shop. And in fast connected speech, the z can change to z as well. And then you have cheese shop, cheese shop, cheese shop. So that can be very hard to understand unless you're used to it, unless you know that this is possible. Or unless, of course, you have a lot of context too. It might, be, it might get easier. But understanding that sounds can change, that um, in, in connected speech, things can sound quite different from what they would sound in isolation. This is key for being an effective listener. Not a, another good example of a simulation is would you, uh, yeah, instead of saying would you, so would you, would you, you. Yeah. And then elision is when sounds disappear. And this is super common. It can happen uh, between a word and another, but it can also happen, um, it can also happen within a word, can't it? Let's see a few examples. For example, we say tell her, tell her the truth. And then the first in her is elided, it disappears. Tell her the truth. 
Uh, but it can also happen, for example, when you say, one problem with teenagers, uh, now one problem with my teenage son is that he texts a lot. He texts a lot. So you have the t in texts being elided in the middle of a, of a complicated uh, consonant cluster. So instead of saying k, s, t, s, texts, you just elide, you, 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 you do away with the t in the middle. She texts. So again, this is not that easy to understand unless you know that this might happen. And so drawing students' attention to that is very important. Linking. Well, we don't really have pause, right, between a consonant sound and a vowel sound. They're constantly linking uh, uh, into, uh, the, 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 the consonant sound is linking into the next vowel sound. Like, for example, in cup of coffee, cup of coffee. You have lots of things happening there. You have the ah in of being reduced to a schwa, but you also have the linking between the p in cup and the vowel, so cup, p, and you have the v in of disappearing. So, so cup of coffee, cup of coffee. So you have three things happening to two phonemes. You have a vowel reduction, you have the linking, and you have a lesion of the sound v. And all this in a cup of coffee. So you see the amount of things you can get from a cup of coffee, apart from joy and love. You can also get uh, linking, vowel reduction, and elision. And intrusion, which is uh, the example I gave before. I hope you heard it. I hope uh, it wasn't when you couldn't hear me. The example of the, uh, I saw it. And um, actually, some intrusive sounds are very easy. And perhaps it does, it, it's not really, it, it's not that important to draw students' attention to them. For example, you have intrusion when you say, how are you? Because if you think about it, you have how, and then you have are. But then between the vowel ow and the vowel ah, you have a wa as in water. Say, how were you? And this sound wa is in neither of the words, so it's intrusion. You have it when you say he is, uh, when you don't contract, of course, because you have he is. And then between the two words, you're going to have ya, as in you, the first sounding you. But he is, and how are you? I mean, they don't get in the way of, of, of comprehension. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to assume that no nationality out, no nationality out there uh, uh, would have problems with this, but I can say, I think very confidently the Brazilian students don't have a problem with that. But especially the intrusive ra can be very tricky. Yeah? In I saw it, law in order, the idea is. And I think that it is one of those things that we have to draw students' attention to, right? So assimilation, elision, linking, intrusion. If you're only going to remember one thing from this session, remember that. We need, as teachers, to study grammar, yes, to study vocabulary, yes, but we also need to study phonology. We need to understand more about pronunciation. So we need to understand assimilation, elision, linking, intrusion, and, and, and a world of other things. So this is a lesson from American English File, a lesson that I teach uh, quite often. Uh, it's elementary, it's A1 level, and it's a traditional, very traditional listening um, activity in that you have uh, listening for general information in the beginning, then you have listening for specific information. This particular one, these pieces of information here are all wrong. Students have to listen to the passage and correct the, um, the sentences. So you have, it was on August 11th? No, it was on July 11th. He was in Buenos Aires? No, he was somewhere else. I think he was in Madrid. Uh, just for you to have an idea of how the passage goes. 3.60. When was your memorable night? Te puedo decir exactamente. Fue el 11 de julio del 2010. I can tell you exactly. It was July 11th, 2010. Why do you remember? Okay. So you can, you can see that it is a bit contrived. It is certainly, as Arub said it in the quote at the beginning of the session, uh, it was modified taking into account that the listener is a student of English, not a proficient speaker of English. So it's easier than the language you would encounter in real life, right? But even when um, 
you're, you're using course book material with students, material that's a bit more contrived, a little less authentic sometimes, you can still find some very interesting things to draw students' attention to. So here's what I was suggesting before. I give these three sentences, for instance, to my students, and I have them say these sentences to each other. If it's one-to-one, -one, I have the student say the sentence to me. Okay, read the first sentence, right? Now read the second sentence. Now read the third sentence, right? Now listen to the sentences and tell me how it's different from what you said. Or, uh, you see, it's, I think it's very important to say that, to, uh, I mean, it's very important not to say that, see how this is more correct, I mean, see how it should be said, or anything like that that is actually um, neg putting, putting what the student said in a negative light. It's not the point. It's not the point. The point is, so, it, is that students will be able to understand this other way of saying it as well. Not necessarily that they will say it that way themselves. Yeah? So for example, then they listen to it and this is what they're going to hear. Actually, let me show you with the parts pointed out. So, the restaurant was full of Spanish tourists. And the other one. Everybody shouted and jumped up. And thousands of kilometers away in another country. So you see that even in a contrived passage, even in a passage that is not very authentic, you still have lots of interesting elements of connected speech. You have the verb to be pronounced was rather than was, and you have full of, full of the, the linking, the reduction of the vowel, full of Spanish tourists. And here you have the, the, the past of the verb shout perfectly pronounced, shouted in, and, and the linking too, right? The t actually becomes a flap, it's a shouted in, jumped up, jumped up, oops, sorry. So shouted and jumped up, shouted and jumped up. So again, even if students are never going to say it this way, they need to be able to understand these links. Thousands of kilometers away in another country. So draw students' attention to, to these bits of language consistently. And what I have seen happen in what I think happens is that students are going to become more and more familiar with uh, these changes in how words sound in connected speech. And they'll be able to, to, to listen more easily. They're going to become, little by little, uh, more effective listeners, which, going back to the first thing I said today, is the most important reason why we teach pronunciation, so that students are going to be able to listen to, to understand what they listen to better. We're not going to do it. We don't have time. But I want to finish then with another quote, Mortimer. It says that a good practical grasp of the weak forms of English is essential to good pronunciation and listening comprehension. Of course, this is... Um, my emphasis here in listening comprehension. And he's only talking about weak forms. So I would extrapolate and say that a good practical grasp of assimilation, elision, uh, linking, intrusion, intonation, and um, sentence stress is essential to listening comprehension. To good pronunciation, yes, but also to listening comprehension. Yeah? So, food for thought. Are we making our students' lives as listeners easier? Or are we just, are we just going through the motions? Just doing lots and lots of, uh, let's expose our students to English. And uh, using the severe method with them uh, day in, day out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Proud. Thanks very much for being here, everybody, on a Tuesday evening uh, at nearly 10.30 well, p.m. in Brasilia, anyway. Uh, I'm thrilled to have you guys here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Igor, we thank you. Because, uh, you know, for me as a teacher, I have been, like, uh, I have to confess that I have been an advocate for the severe method. And I had no idea I was doing that. You know that that's amazing because you enlighten, you know, my my my, my practice. So I'm gonna start thinking more about my my teaching practice in terms of phonology and listening. So thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you very much. It's been 
It's been great. If anybody, uh, I understood there was some sort of Q&A. If anybody wants to ask anything, I mean. Let's yes, talk. there there are certainly some questions. But uh, before that, Igor, could you tell, tell us a little bit more about your course and also about the references? Because people are very curious to see those. Uh, sure, I actually have a bibliography. Can I, can I ask you guys, if it, this was all reading that I did, lots of reading that I did uh, during Delta Module 2 last year. So these are all articles. Every single one of these uh, um, quotes come from articles. Some are quotes within articles, and uh, the Caldwell quote is actually from his book, Phonology for Listening. But if anybody wants the complete bibliography, just send me an email, and I'll send you the, the, the bibliography. Not the actual text. Some of them are copyrighted, but I'll send you the, the, the names of all the authors, the texts, and the books that, I've, that I used. All right. So what is your email again? I wrote it at .br, right? Eager with H at eagerwithh.com. The VR in the course is a course, a phonology course for teachers that starts on March 10th. And um, it's on, it's not exactly on phonology for listening. It's on phonology more, I mean, holistically. On phonology. Phonology. And how long, how long does it take, the course, Igor? Four Saturdays. Four Saturdays from March 10th mm -hmm. to March 31st. Uh, but the sessions are recorded. If Saturdays don't work for people, you can watch a recording of the sessions later. Okay, okay, wonderful. And what time does, does the live uh, broadcast start? Brazilia time, 1.30 to 4. Okay, great. great. So let's see if we have questions. And we do. Um, for, uh, there are many people saying thank you, congratulations, because it was really wonderful. Wow. Yeah. There, were, there were almost like 100 people watching you live. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So Tuesday evening. Uh, Igor, uh, Thiago Silva is asking a question. Igor, do you think we should bring that up every time we have a listening activity in class? I think he means connected speech, uh, features of connected speech. Yeah, I don't, I don't normally use terminology, but yes, if not every time. I mean, we do have time constraints, yeah, but the vast majority of times, yes. I mean, most times we do listening work, there should be at least a, a, a a five-minute segment on complicated sentences and connected speech. I think so, yeah. So do we have any other questions? Yeah, uh, yes, Carla is asking uh, the uh, name of the first book Chago about asked, pronunciation. To bring up, uh, oh, no, you've asked that. One. Yes, I, I just asked that one. Yeah. The um, book, book, which is the, of, of all these quotes, the only one that comes from a book is Phonology for Listening by Richard Caldwell. That's the name of the book, Phonology for Listening. And uh, Caldwell has a second book coming up now. Uh, it's going to be launched at ITF. I can't remember for the life of me the title of the book, but it's also on Phonology for Listening. And I can't wait to get my hands on it. So. Yeah. Yes, it seems like a very good book. And. Um, Natalia Guerrero on Richmond Share, she wrote a brilliant post, a brilliant article about uh, his uh, webinar in which Richard talked more a little about his book and what the book entails. So if you're curious, go to Richmond Share and check the, the I, I don't, I'm not sure it's the latest, but uh, it's one of her latest uh, articles. I, I think uh, it's her latest, yeah, yeah. And I, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Igor, Jay wants to know what was the book that had the biggest impact in your career? Uh, yeah. The English Verb, The English Verb by Michael Lewis. Oh. Yeah, so that was when I was doing the CELTA. I think it's an absolutely fantastic book on, 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 on the English Verb, on grammar specifically, but uh, absolutely phenomenal. English Verb. Yeah. That was it. Okay, so Bia has another question. Uh, when you teach pronunciation or point it out, do you use or show uh, students the phonemic symbols? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. I use phonemic symbols all the time in most classes. I think it's a great, I think it's perfectly possible to teach pronunciation without using phonemic symbols. But I think phonemic symbols make pronunciation something that it typically isn't, which is visual. Mm -hmm. So, one way of making tricky bits visual for, for students on, on, on the board. And I think it's 
uh, yeah, very, very important. So yes, it, al it also it also helps them uh, learn how to read the the dictionary, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It's one more thing they can get from dictionaries: pronunciation. Yeah. Learn autonomy. Uh, yeah, she just commented that her, usually her students tend to freak out when they see the phonemic symbols, so she usually improvises. Yeah, everything that's new, right? But I think uh, I never expect, I've never asked my students to actually transcribe things or use phonemic symbols themselves. I just want them to be able to associate the symbols with the sounds they represent. And it's little by little, I would never, I mean, Adrian Underhill, the boss, suggests that the very first class with every student, you go over the whole chart and uh, it works for Adrian Underhill because he is Adrian Underhill, but I've never actually done that. And I wouldn't. For me, it's little by little, not uh, the whole chart in one go. That can be really daunting and, and scary, intimidating. Yeah, yeah, true, true that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so you. do you have any other questions? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we're, we're done with the questions. Yeah, so now talking about certificates, if you're interested in getting a certificate for this session, this is where you should go bit.ly, Lee is L-Y, uh, Brelt. Now let me check it out because uh, yesterday. Brelt, Brelt yeah. Week 2018 certificate. It's bit.ly yes. slash Brelt Prone Week 2018 certificate. Yeah. Yes. I just posted here, but you have to like to copy it and get it everything together because Google Hangouts doesn't allow us to, to send links. Can I just say one, one final thing? Yeah, sure. So as as Budun said in the beginning, I'm vice president of Brass Tiso at the moment, uh, uh, which just means really that I'm another volunteer. We, we all are. And uh, we're going to have the big international conference in Caxias do Sul in July, and from we'll July to July 22nd. And uh, I really hope to meet you guys there uh, over a glass of wine to talk a little bit more about phonology for listening and and much more so Caxias do Sul July 19th to July 22nd yes. we'll be there right Thiago we'll be there for sure I'll be there for sure okay guys so this is a wrap thank you so much for watching us thank you Igor thank you guys and we'll see you again tomorrow right Thiago sorry, yes. sorry just one last thing one last thing congratulations yeah on the phenomenal work you guys do. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're so kind. Every, yeah. All of you, all Browns. Congratulations. Yeah. Great job. So, tomorrow is Wednesday, and we are going to have the chat, right, Charlie? Yeah, we are going to have a very special uh, Braille chat in yeah. which we're going to talk about uh, hands-on ideas and techniques to be used in class with young learners, teens, and all. So uh, remember to use the hashtags. We've been encouraging people to use the hashtags for this particular uh, chat. So uh, hashtag brown, y, l, brown, teens, brown, adults, and we'll have lots of ideas and techniques. Wonderful. That's it. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And again, if you want the certificate for this session, it's only going to be available. Uh, uh, the form is just going to be open for 15 minutes. So bit.ly slash Brelt Prime Week 2018 certificate. Wonderful. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Igor, again. Bye, and. Bye. We hope you have a nice night. Bye. Bye.